Is is Michael going to introduce us, or should we just introduce ourselves? Good morning, <laughs> and sorry for the delay. Thank you for being here. My name is Michael Kelker. I teach English at St. Charles Community College. I'm the organizer of Democracy Days 2001 to present, and I'm very excited to have this panel session on civic civic engagement in the wake of 2020 and our pandemic. This is another one of the exciting, intellectually stimulating panel sessions that we always have during Democracy Days. And this is a very special topic. And Bryony Carter will take us away. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you for everybody for taking the opportunity to tune in. I'm Bryony Carter. I'm in the English department as an associate professor, and I'm also the chair of the Service Learning and Civic Engagement Program here at SEC. And so today we're going to talk obviously about civic engagement and how we are still pursuing it and other activist projects, even though the pandemic and other factors that have been occurring throughout this year have made it very difficult in some ways to do so. And in a lot of ways have opened up a lot of opportunities for us to still strive toward a better world. And so I'm gonna start uh, first of all, just by asking everybody on the panel to briefly introduce themselves and their role at SEC. And then I'm going to go through a very short PowerPoint explaining how the Civic Engagement and Service Learning Program operates at SEC. And then we're going to get into the good stuff, which is a discussion of what we can do to still affect change in our world, even though we seem restricted and separated from one another during this time. And so again, my name is Bryony Carter. Um, as I said, I'm in the English department and I also chair the service learning and civic engagement program. Whoever wants to introduce themselves next. <laughs> okay, I'll introduce myself. I'm Grace Moser, I'm history faculty on campus. Um, I am teaching my first service learning class this semester um, for African American history. Was there anything else I was supposed to say? No, nope, that's perfect for okay. now. Okay. I'm Lindsay Brand. I'm an English faculty member. I am teaching in two sections of Service Learning English 101 currently. I'm Audra Notgrass. Um, I'm a student at SCC and I have participated in the Service Learning Project. Wonderful. And so I'm going to share my screen. Um, like I said, I'm going to go through a couple of PowerPoint slides, and then we're going to get to the good stuff where we really delve deeply into this subject. And so uh, can everybody see my screen here? I always like to check and make sure. Okay, cool. So uh, as uh, as we noted, this is called Civic Engagement in the Wake of 2020, which is quite a dramatic title, but we are also dealing with a pretty dramatic moment in our lives for so many different reasons. And so I want to talk, first of all, about uh, service learning and civic engagement. I'll go over that briefly um, in the interest of time. An overview of SEC and the service learning and civic engagement program, and importantly, during the semester, how our programming has shifted in response to the pandemic. Uh, panelists' experience of activism and civic engagement in person and uh, in the remote context. Why does this work matter? Why, why are we still pursuing these efforts uh, at a time like this? Uh, and even during you know, so-called normal times when we're not in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. And, and this is hopefully going to be wonderful information for everybody. How can you get involved with your community inside and outside of the classroom virtually and remotely? How can you step outside your comfort zone and um, move toward a more equitable uh, world? And even with the kind of restrictions that we're now facing. And so when we talk about civic engagement, it's a pretty broad term, and I find that this definition best sums it up, and we'll be looking at different ways that this operates in and outside of the classroom. But in Civic Responsibility and Higher Education, Thomas Elridge states, civic engagement means working to make a difference in the civic life of our communities and developing the combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation to make that difference. It means promoting the quality of life in a community through both political and non-political processes. And so civic engagement acts as an umbrella term in a lot of ways for community and civic activism inside and outside of the classroom. Service learning, which is the term that most of you have probably heard every so often um, on, at SEC, is a pedagogical strategy. It's something that's used in the classroom in teaching 
that combines community engagement, whether that's um, some form of class project activism or traditional volunteer work with the coursework. And so students complete projects in the class that complement the course objectives and serve the community in some way. And so it's a reciprocal relationship. Um, the project that students and faculty undertake in the class help better inform the material they're reading, writing, and discussing in class and vice versa. They go into the project having a greater understanding of what's uh, happening because of what they're doing in class. And so service learning projects can be volunteer based. And that's the way we tend to think of traditional service learning is that students are required to do some sort of a volunteer project that serves the community, but they don't have to be. Service learning has a pretty broad definition. There are different ways that we can serve our communities. Part of that is through volunteer experience, part of that is through other forms of activism. And so I'm sharing here something that we call the social change wheel. And this is a, um, uh, uh, infographic, it has many different forms, but this is my favorite version that's from um, Campus Compact Minnesota, which is a civic engagement um, uh, organization. And you can see here that there are many different ways that we can be active agents in our community. Certainly charitable volunteerism, the second from the top left, is the one with which we're most most familiar, but there are different ways to be an advocate. Uh, community and economic development, community-based participatory research, which can be a part of a research paper that a student does in class. Community building, organizing, um, philanthropy, there are deliberative dialogue. There are so many different ways that we can affect social change that contribute to civic engagement in these ways. And so I'll come back to this chart later on in this presentation, but I wanted to give you an idea up front of different ways that we can interact and serve our community, uh, even from uh, the standpoint that we're in right now. And so just a little bit of information about our program. Uh, we piloted the program in 2014 with full program status and funding in 2015. Uh, we offer both curricular and co-curricular programming. And so the uh, most common thing that we offer are, of course, service learning classes. And I work with faculty to develop projects for particular classes. We're active members of Campus Compact, which is that national organization dedicated to civic engagement. We have over 30 community and college university partnerships, community partners with whom we work directly to do service projects and also college and university partnerships with whom we work to um, put on different programming throughout the community. We have two day of service events per academic year. That's part of that co-curricular programming. Some of you may have heard of day of service before or participated in it in the past. Obviously due to the pandemic, we had to cancel our day of service in the spring. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing um, this semester to uh, still serve the community, but with the restriction, the necessary restrictions in place. Uh, in terms of pass and completion rates, service learning classes, and I just noticed my typo there, completion rates um, are at 92.1% and pass rates at 84.9%, and that's above the national average. And so uh, based on assessment uh, from classes, anecdotally, and also just speaking with students and faculty, students who perform in service learning classes are likely to get really invested in it because of the you know, importance and the wide ranging effect of the work that they're doing. And so it's a really fulfilling experience on so many different levels. So we offer an average of 18 sections each semester across the disciplines. Uh, and in each class, students are required to complete about 15 hours of service work. And so as I noted earlier, what constitutes service varies depending on the class. Uh, again, it can be traditional volunteer work uh, during a regular semester, or even you'll see ways that virtual volunteer work takes place right now, or it can be a class-wide or independent project that still raises awareness about an issue in some way and serves our community by bringing information forward. Service learning classes don't involve more work. Um, the service component replaces some traditional homework and assessments, and so the objectives of the class are still being met just in a different way through the project. 
We have various types of paperwork as part of the service learning class. Uh, all students sign a liability media and COVID-19 release. Uh, the COVID-19 release, um, which I'll talk about in just a minute, is part of the kind of revamping of the program we've had to do in the face of the pandemic. Uh, students who complete projects for organization uh, for an organization fill out paperwork related to that, such as a contract and an activity log. Most importantly, perhaps, is the fact that reflection is something that continually occurs. Students aren't just asked to go out into the community and do a project without any kind of work beyond that. Students are continually asked to reflect on the work they're doing how that work relates to the class and how what they're doing in the class gives them a better understanding of the work. So again, that reciprocal relationship is always key. And this is another benefit to a service learning class. They include a transcript designation, which is something that's unique to our college. And I'll show you a picture of that right now um, because many of you may have heard me say something about this in the past, but I'm pleased to actually have a screenshot of one. This is from a transcript. And you can see that uh, it's English 101 02S. And what that S does is it triggers this text below it that states that it was a designated service learning class. Students enrolled in the course undertake substantial community service projects and complete coursework and assignments related to these projects. And so it's like a permanent record of community engagement, which can be really helpful for students on so many different levels. And of course, it doesn't affect transferability in so the S is on the section number, not the course number, so it can easily transfer to other colleges and universities. So we've made quite a few adjustments since COVID-19, uh, with a few exceptions, i.e. classes that have some face-to-face -face component, but we have only a few of these. Service learning classes this semester are in a virtual or remote online format. Uh, and so those are classes that meet over Zoom in terms of remote or by virtual, I mean online classes, fully online. Instructors and students are encouraged to think outside the box with course projects. There are so many different ways to engage, such as that social change wheel suggests. And so all service learning classes therefore allow for virtual, remote, low to no contact project options. And there are opportunities for students to do in-person volunteering if they wish although the former classes, virtual, remote, and low to no contact are encouraged. For those students who do want to pursue in-person projects, uh, they do have to abide by CDC guidelines, physical distancing, and wearing masks. And instead of the usual day of service event, uh, SEC community members will be able to participate in what I'm calling a week of service, which will be in a way for us to engage with the community in a remote or virtual way and um, that'll take place sometime at the end of October. I'm still working out the details on that. There are many different outcomes of participating in this work. Again, those reflection exercises are really important and key to a full understanding of the work that students are undertaking. Students apply course material to the real world and vice versa. They often continue their community engagement work long after the semester has ended. And this goes for faculty and staff who participate in these kinds of efforts as well. Participating in this kind of work um, helps with future goals, certainly on so many different levels, personally, academically, and professionally. And, and perhaps this is the most important outcome of any kind of community engagement effort. Once a person participates in this work, it's difficult to turn a blind eye to injustice and inequity. And that's really at the crux of what we're talking about today is that the, the work is important on so many different levels, not just because it's fulfilling a class credit or you know, engaging with a new pedagogical strategy, but it's also about affecting change on so many different levels. And that's why so many of us are so passionate about this kind of work. And so I'm going to pause my talking here. I've talked quite enough for this up to this point. And so I'm going to ask the rest of the panelists to please introduce themselves and answer, uh, ponder and answer the question, why is this work important to you? And why is it important to continue this work despite the restrictions we face due to the pandemic? And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a minute and I can put the question back up at anyone's request. Uh, I don't know if you all want to, you know, just kind of go for answering the question or if you want me to call on you, what would you prefer? I guess we should have discussed this beforehand. What do you think? You can call on us. Okay. How about Grace then? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So the, uh, I think, well, just to remind you guys, um, my name is Grace Moser. I'm history faculty at SCC. I've been teaching here for 10 years and I've watched Bryony since she developed the service learning project or program and always thought it was really important and good, but I never did a service learning class because I thought um, if you were going to learn, um, there, it had to apply to history in some way. And I just couldn't think of a project um, that could be applied until I started rethinking what civic engagement meant. Um, and civic engagement uh, is not just like going and picking up trash by the side of the highway or going and helping out at a um, animal shelter. Like those are good things, but I couldn't connect them to what we were doing in history. And then civic engagement really broadened my perspective to realize it could be like putting together um, an online website for um, black history sites in St. Peter's. It could be um, working on a national history project and doing research in newspapers. It could be registering people to vote in areas where there's been low voter turnout for people who haven't been like represented in um, their communities. Um, so once I realized that, I was like, oh, okay, well then service learning is doing the work that I'm hoping that people will already do as a result of learning about um, social history and how ordinary people are living and working and things we can do to change. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, was I supposed to talk about yet about what we're doing in our classes or no? Um, I was gonna question? move on to that in question two, if that's okay. Okay, that's fine, yes. Cool, thank you, Grace. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, how about you? All right, I'm Lindsay Brand, I'm an English uh, uh, faculty member why the work is important to me and continuing to, during the pandemic, I believe is the question. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, I mean, wouldn't it make sense that it would continue during the pandemic because people are in need more than ever. And to, to me, it seems like a very obvious thing. Of course, we're gonna continue doing service learning and we have these different relationships with different agencies. And now's the, I mean, we always need these resources because um, for what, you know, the reason that these agencies have sprung up, if you're, if we're thinking about like working together with an agency, is because there's needs in our society that are not being met by the government and the elected officials are not taking care of that. And so these have sprung up and of course we need to keep contributing to them if we can. So um, yeah, I think it's really important to continue doing it during this pandemic. Was that the full question? Sure, that's that's that, that's, that's that's what I have to say. I totally missed the working during the pandemic part of my question. I apologize. No, that's okay. Do you have anything you want to add on? It all comes together. But if you want to add anything, um, I would just say that there's always something. There's always going to be something that's happening that could scare us mm -hmm. and keep us from doing something. Um, doing work for social justice, for example. Um, so continuing and, and adapting is important if you want to create the society that you want to see. And I know people keep saying this, like the term social distancing. I've heard the criticism of it is like we shouldn't be moving apart socially, just physically moving apart. And I think that also is a good description of what we're doing now. Although we mm -hmm. physically can't be as close together, we should still be together as a community help doing this work. Yeah, and I think that's a good distinction. And I've been trying to incorporate the term physical distancing into my vocabulary as opposed to social distancing, which of course is the, um, the phrase that we were kind of introduced to early on in this. But I, I agree, you know, language is so important. And I think that that really does speak to uh, what, we're, what we're looking at here. All right, Audra, what do you think? Um, and I'll put the, every time I move on to a new panelist, I'll go ahead and share the screen again briefly so you can re-familiarize yourself with the question. So um, I'm Audra Nagras. I'm a student at SCA. Um, I've been involved in activism for quite a, lot, quite a while. Um, did a lot of work when I lived in Tennessee. And then when I moved up here, I became aware of the many needs here in St. Louis. Um, I kind of got my jump start during the Stockley protest. I think it was three years ago now. Um, so, you know, it's just, 
it's kind of, I was raised to have a strong sense of social justice and it just kind of spilled over into my daily life. Um, I want to piggyback off what Grace and Lindsay were saying that it's not, that social distancing is probably not a good term. Um, I do like physical distancing. Um, there are more needs now than ever before. Um, there's election coming up, there's fires, there's um, police brutality, there's, you know, um, unhoused population. Um, we, we need to all come together to work on these issues and we, we, we can do it remotely. It is possible. It, it might require a little bit more creativity <laughs> than just, you know, going out and, you know, delivering meals or something, but, you know, it, it is possible to do that. Um, I'm not even sure if I answered the question because I forgot the question. <laughs> Here, I'll go ahead and share it again, just in case there's anything else you want to. Yeah, I have it written down, but I don't think I have it written down correctly. So yeah, just, we, we can't give up. It's, it's easy to say, well, you know, I'm going to be stuck at home for the next six months, but we can't give up. It's, it's too important to, to give up. Exactly. And I'll, you know, add my two cents to the question as well. Um, the work is vitally important to me. It's such a, it's such a part of who I am. It's inextricable from who I am, um, caring about these issues and wanting to make a difference. I mean, you know, I can tout my degrees or certificates or professional qualifications or whatever it is, but this is something that's intrinsic. It, it's, it's, it's part of who I am. And so to simply just stop trying to promote a more equal and just world um, due to, you know, these restrictions is something that is um, not a good enough reason for me. And so we have a lot to thank technology for in this respect, because it's given us so many different ways to engage with others while still looking out for our own health um, at the same time. And so uh, we'll look at some of those examples in just a few minutes. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again again and um, talk a little bit more about what that looks like. And so we have several classes that are pursuing projects um, this semester that have had to change kind of the course of how they usually approach service learning. And so one example is Chamber Choir, uh, which is taught by Becky Thorne in the music department. And normally Chamber Choir, which may seem for those who are kind of coming into service learning for the same time, uh, it, it it's a less traditional form of service learning in that it's not that volunteer work that we're usually familiar with. What Chamber Choir traditionally does is goes, they go out into the community and they perform for various community events, such as the 9-11 Memorial, um, Veterans Day, they've performed at various community events and organizations. And so because that is something that's restricted right now due to college policy and also just in the interest of safety and health, They've um, had to kind of change course and figure out a different way to still serve the community with their gift of music. And so what they're doing this semester is that they're recording a concert to be streamed through the St. Charles Library's Live at the Library virtual event. And so this is one way that they're still able to reach the community through that. They're also um, going to be streaming other concerts toward the end of the semester so that it can still be shared with others. At the same time, I know that uh, Professor Thorne is working with Don Huffman in our ESL uh, department to develop a way that students can converse with one another about the love of music and about uh, language and how that operates. And so that's another way that they can accomplish the goals of service learning and sharing uh, their work and their gift with others. And so that's something that we're working on is still in progress, but they have some wonderful things planned for this semester. College Composition 2, um, which is a class that's being taught by uh, Edwina Cooper. Um, English 102 is a class that is a writing intensive and literary based class. And so um, the service learning projects that are taking place there are an array of writing, transcribing, and literature-based online volunteer projects to complete. One example is uh, Project Gutenberg, which is a repository of texts that uh, no longer have to 
be concerned with copyright because of the time that has passed, need help transcribing these classic texts. And so that's one project that students are able to undertake. Uh, I know that uh, Professor Cooper also has uh, the Smithsonian as an option. Students can transcribe um, artifacts and articles for that. And there are other um, projects that are available in a completely virtual context. So students can still give back to the virtual community in that respect and help enhance the learning for others who will come across these texts at some point. Uh, in ESL 100, and this is Don Huffman and Katie Brown, and as I said, uh, I know that Professor Huffman and Professor Thorne are working on a way that Chamber Choir and ESL 100 and other ESL students through Conversation Circle can come together and share cultural knowledge with one another. Um, and in their class, they would normally pursue uh, what we call the Shoe Crew Project, which is a shoe collection um, project that is then given to an organization to help provide clean water for communities in need. And since that's something that's normally an on-campus project and not something that we can necessarily complete this semester, they are pursuing other avenues of still uh, producing service learning. And one way they're doing that is through that conversation circle. And then I will, of course, let uh, Grace Moser and Lindsey Brand discuss how they're implementing this into College Composition One and African American History. I'm teaching a service learning class, Gender Issues and Literature, this semester. And this was the pleasure of having Audra in a couple of years ago. And this is a service learning class. In the class, we read a variety of texts um, that have to do with issues of gender, race, class, and sexuality. And so these are nonfiction texts, these are essays, these are short stories and poems. And as part of the service learning project, students are required to do a 15-hour project that dovetails with one of the themes in the class. And so I've had many different students uh, approach this from a virtual standpoint since it is an online class to begin with and most of my students this semester are doing a virtual or remote project as well. I just had a conference with a student yesterday who has decided to volunteer for a political campaign uh, from a remote um, from a remote place and so that student is going to um, make calls, send text messages, and help promote that political candidate um, it, whose interests intersect with the themes in the class. And so that's one example. I've had students do donation drives, which is a low to no contact way collecting items for an organization such as the Crisis Nursery or the Bridgeway Women's Center and doing a contactless drop off with those items. I've also had students do social media campaigns where they raise awareness about a particular issue that's related to the class, whether it's through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or um, another format, they're able to raise awareness in that way. And so um, there are so many different ways that students can engage in this in my particular class. And again, I'm looking at this social change wheel. Uh, you see voting and formal political activities as part of the social change wheel, which I mentioned a student is doing. Uh, and again, deliberative dialogue, discussion circles, using forums to prompt a group to consider multiple opt on an issue, uh, community building and community organizing. These are all things that can be done in a remote, virtual, or low contact way. And so I'm going to move on to question two then and ask the panelists, what are some examples of civic engagement and activism that can be done safely in a remote, low to no contact or virtual context, whether it's part of a class or even outside of a class? Uh, because again, focused on bringing this work out of the classroom once a class ends. And so I'll go ahead and ask Lindsay to start, if you don't mind. Okay, so my uh, I'm teaching English 101, but our course topic is environment, which is broad enough that it can cover en environmental concerns or environmental topics, but it can also um, deal, it also deals with the idea of an environment, meaning like a space and thinking about the idea of space within our um, community and what spaces are. Um, and also thinking about, for example, thinking about parks, like what are parks or communal space? Um, are they free for everybody? So it, there, there are um, there's some topics that we are beginning to get into. And my students have come up with some, I, I, I gave them a lot of freedom. I, I, I offered them some ideas, but I also 
wanted them to come up with ideas about what they'd want to do with this concept. Uh, one of the cool things that this is a low contact thing, and I think it goes under on the wheel, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was a daily socially responsible behavior maybe, but it also goes with awareness. I have a group of two friends who they want to do um, a campaign about plogging. And if you're not familiar with plogging, it's, it's a Swedish term. It comes from the Swedish verb, which is plucka up, which means pick up and jogga, which means jogging. So the new verb is plaga. So plogging is the act of jogging and picking up um, litter in your community. So they said that they're going to start doing that and they're gonna keep reflective journals about it. And then what they wanna do with that is spread awareness because they didn't think a lot of their neighbors knew what the term was. So they're going to, they're gonna raise awareness for what this, this is. So that was one kind of cool thing that they came up with. Um, other, than, other than that, uh, one thing that I was also excited about, a student came up with this, was they wanted to do research. So they're gonna spend some of their um, hours for the class doing research about composting at home. And they are going to then start the process of uh, turning their household into a composting household. And they're working with other people to spread awareness and spread information. So people in their community who may wanna take up composting will have those resources available to them. So those, those, are, those are two examples and students came up with those. I offer minimal help and I was very impressed. That's wonderful. And I know that I also discussed with your students when I, I, I do orientations and meet the students at the beginning of every semester uh, in these classes. I know I remember discussing with them that if they do want to get outside and of course getting outside and getting fresh air is something that's very helpful um, and can be safely done in a remote or low to no contact way. There are many community organizations in the area that need help with that trash pickup. Um, or with landscaping, honeysuckle eradication. I mean, one example is Calvary Church that's across the street from us, um, from our main SEC campus, have a huge campus. And they, um, they have a native Missouri plant garden that also functions as a butterfly garden. And that's been overwhelmingly maintained by SEC students, volunteers over the years. And so, that's certainly an option for students who may want, or any kind of volunteer, faculty, staff, anyone in the community who may want to get outside, get some fresh air, and also tend to something that still needs our help, even in the midst of the time we're living, and perhaps even more um, than usual because of the number, the fewer volunteers who are getting involved right now. And that is something that can be done, as I said, in a low to no contact manner. Yeah, and some of them are going to be photographing the, the native butterfly garden. So I'm very excited. Oh, that's that. Yeah, that's lovely. So, yeah, and I know Greenway Network um, tends to have a lot of projects that um, can be remote to low, no contact, remote and low to no contact as well. So there's so many different ways that we can get involved helping the environment um, beyond that. So I'm so excited to hear about what your students are doing. Audra, can I turn to you next? And I'll put the question back up on the screen again, just, just for fun. So when I was in the service learning class, um, I, I took it virtually. I think it was, it's only offered virtually, correct? Um, um, the gender studies that I did. But anyway, um, I decided to make a website um, using the information that I've learned over the years, um, specifically the information that I learned on the streets, protesting, being kettled, being arrested, spending hours in jail. Um, I decided to put all of that information in a website um, so that people, not that website, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's called Shy Girl's Guide to Activism. Oh, did I not share it here? I'm sorry, I thought I did. This is, One yeah, sorry, no, oh, this is a different website. There we go. Got it. I have two of your websites yes. up. Put the yes. wrong one. There this, we go. this website, yes. Um, I compiled all of the information that I learned um, through experience, through others, reading articles from, you know, way back in the, you know, Occupy Wall Street days to the civil rights movement from the 60s, um, listening to other activists who are out in the streets following their lead. Um, so it's just all right here. 
it's concise. I'm not a web developer, so it's not very pretty, <laughs> but all the information is there and not just in my head. So I, I really, this, this, um, this project was very helpful for me because I was able to see exactly how much I learned, um, all the things that I didn't know, what I can do um, to help, you know, other organizations across the country through, you know, researching various organizations and websites. So that was, that was a really good your, project. I'll share your website with others too. And I think that, you know, obviously there are so many different um, activist organizations listed here and they, they'll have a variety of different ways to help out. But I think that this section here on armchair resistance, as you call it, mm -hmm. is something that's really important because as you say, not everyone can get out and march the streets for justice and here are some suggestions for the so-called armchair activist. Exactly. I'm, I'm very good at getting out and marching in the streets. Um, I have anxiety issues. So for me, making a phone call is more terrifying than staring down police officers. <laughs> um, so everyone has their gifts and their strengths and we all need to, you know, lean into those strengths to make a difference in our community. So I have, I mean, I have some other ideas if, you know, that kind of piggyback off of what you were saying, like how we can get involved in the face of COVID, you know, phone banking for politicians is one. I've done that before when I, when I did that many years ago, um, I was given a sheet and I was able to make phone calls from my room. This was back before I had phone call anxiety. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was, it was a good learning experience for me. You know, I didn't have to leave the house it's, it's safe. It's, you know, physically distanced. So yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot we can do. Thank you, Audra. And Grace, I'll turn to you next. Hi everyone. This is my daughter, Ramona. She decided to join us today to help me out. Um, so what I did for my class, uh, which by the way, Audra, I might use some of those examples that you have on your website for my class. Cause I think that would be really beneficial. And I didn't know about some of them. Um, but while what I did for my class, um, I really wanted them to uh, actively work towards preserving black history. So I'm teaching an African-American history class and um, we've been talking about how our, that history has been marginalized and excluded from the national narrative that is taught in high schools and elementary schools. Um, so I tr tried to create uh, and choose ideas for topics that were designed or centered around preserving black history. So um, the socially distanced ones that I found was transcribing manuscripts related to African-American history. So there's some anti-slavery manuscripts with the Boston Public Library, and that's open to anybody. Anybody can go in there and do it, even if you want to, even if you're not in a, a service learning class. Um, and then there's another one called Freedom on the Move. It's a database that has, uh, that's transcribing fugitive slave um, ads. Uh, sometimes in slavery, the only record, record of a black person is an ad that was placed that gives their physical description to track them down and return them to their masters. So because slaves were considered property, sometimes the only record we have are either these slave notices or a description of them in probate records after somebody has died. So Freedom on the Move is tracking those runaway slave ads and transcribing them for researchers and people can have access to them. I also have a newspaper project that I went on sabbatical last fall and actually got to meet the people who were in charge of this at the United States Holocaust Museum and Memorial in Washington, DC. And they're doing a national newspaper project where they're having people look in their local newspapers for stories related to the Holocaust and these certain, certain events, because there's a myth that people in the United States didn't know about it and that's why we didn't do anything. But the truth is that people did know about it and they were writing about it in the newspapers at the time that it was occurring. And uh, this is especially true for African-Americans um, because they related Jim Crow segregation and eugenics and everything that happened in the United States to what Hitler was doing with the Holocaust. Um, so I found a newspaper that we had in St. Louis that is not in their 
um, collection. So one of the options I have for my students is to go to UMSL and read these newspapers on microfilm. You, it's not entirely contactless, but because it's researching on a microfilm, it's probably safer than like face-to-face -face type stuff. I also have a public history project um, that I am very, very excited about. Um, it's with Greenwood Cemetery, um, which is was a segregated black cemetery, <clears throat> non-sectarian. So usually African-Americans, we don't think about this, but in segregation, African-Americans didn't have any place to put their dead because dead, um, because white cemeteries were segregated. Um, so for example, Dred Scott is the only black person that was buried in Calvary Cemetery um, prior to segregation. And that was because white people made it possible for him, but he's not buried with his wife. His wife, Harriet, is buried at Greenwood because Greenwood was the only place that would allow um, black burials. And so as a result of that, there's no, endowment for um, Greenwood. And there's nobody that's publicly funding it. There's no trust, there's nothing. Um, so if you were to go to Greenwood um, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it just looked like a field. 35 acres of long, tall grass, all of the cemetery, all the tombstones covered up and toppled. Um, but this uh, awesome coalition of black activists in St. Louis saved it. And now it is being preserved and there's an opportunity to volunteer with them just for lawn keeping because there's a retired couple, a married couple that are the groundskeepers and they do everything. Um, so uh, it's so neat. Um, if you are looking for like one of the other things that they connected me to that I'm going to participate in uh, coming up in a couple weekends, they're doing a voter registration drive with um, and Lindsay is going to do it with me. I'm very excited about that. Um, they're doing a voter registration drive where they have black actors and dressed up as suffragettes because we hear the story about white suffragettes, but there are black suffragettes who are here in St. Louis who are really exciting that are buried in Greenwood. Um, so it's just actively preserving that history and just helping preserve that story and keep it so that people can come and visit and learn and research and see their family. So that to me is not just public history, it's also social justice, because to me, it's insane that um, if you go right around the corner from that cemetery, there's a white cemetery that's beautiful and pristine and perfect and gated. And then right there at Greenwood, it's like you could miss it just driving down the street. So the other thing that I had um, is I had some social justice organizations that people can volunteer with. Um, just to throw it out there for anybody who's interested, I really like Color of Change. Um, Color of Change is uh, led by Black leaders and Black activists, and I've done a, a phone call campaign for them before where they just like, you call a number and they connect you to all the other people. So it's really easy. You don't have to dial anything. You just click next, next, and leave a message. And if, you're, if you have phone anxiety, my recommendation for you is you write a script. Like you write it down and just read it. Um, and then you'll just say the same thing. And the more you do it, the easier it will get. Like, especially with those ones that are just like one after the other. So my first couple ones, they were kind of scared and stumbling. And then the other ones I was like, bam, 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 I'm done, right? I got you, next. Um, the other organization that I really like is Fair Fight. It's by Stacey Abrams in Georgia. Um, one of the things that happened in 2015 is that Congress gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And as a result of that, um, there's been voter suppressed, widespread voter suppression, suppression of African American votes and other minorities in America. And this actually cost Stacey Abrams the election in Georgia to be governor. It was just so shady and corrupt. Um, sometime you can talk to me about it if you ever wanna hear me vent. But she has gone on to create this organization that is now dedicated to preserving people's right to vote. And it's so timely and important and there's things that you can do with that, but that's fair fight and they have volunteer opportunities too. So that's been my approach. Um, I've been trying to keep it really structured uh, to African-American history. I'm also open, my, I just met with my students. We've only been meeting for two weeks because it's a late start class. But um, I left it open to them if they want to try to create their own 
project, that's an option too, but I had these ideas for them. Thank you. It's so many wonderful, you know, brilliant ideas and so many different ways to get engaged, both from the standpoint of public history and also affecting what history will look like years from now. You know, what, how is the present going to, um, how is that going to look, you know, years from now and how are we able to connect these efforts? And that's something that's really important about this work is the intersection of all of this, that um, you know, we can compartmentalize it based on the various classes that we're teaching, but we see that the need for a more just and equitable society um, intersects with all sorts of different facets of our identities and all sorts of different needs in our community. And so this is just a wonderful array from all of you here about um, how we can make those changes. And so, um, Grace, you kind of uh, led us on to question three, which is wonderful. Um, and here, let me pull this up again, which is, how can we connect efforts within our own communities with larger, and that can be regional, national, and international, whatever scale it is you want to place it on, issues and current events? Why is this important? We tend to think of community engagement and civic engagement as taking place in our own neighborhoods, which is something that is vital and you know important and necessary um, but also one can make the argument that what we do on the local level reverberates regionally nationally and internationally and making those connections between the work we do the small work and the big work so to speak um, is something that we should constantly continually remind ourselves of and so Audra if it's okay I'm going to start with you what is your answer to this question how can we make these connections why is it important to make these connections whether we're talking about history or we're talking about current events or just issues that continue to affect us over time One thing that I found interesting was the fact that my neighbors are listening to me. I have been posting on Facebook for years about Black Lives Matter. I've had neighbors who are very hostile to the idea that Black lives do matter. Um, and instead of being a jerk and you know starting flame wars on their walls, I've just engaged them in polite conversation firm conversation but also you know you know being a decent human <laughs> uh not calling them names and one of my neighbors um after george floyd was killed she did a complete 180 and now she's posting about black lives matter and engaging with people on her own wall in respectful conversation and she's educating herself and it's been really cool to watch just to see how i'm not taking credit for you know her her change in you know thinking but we have had many conversations and so it's really cool to see her be so completely against black lives matter to now you know being so pro and you know engaging with her her people in her social circles so that's that's been really cool to see um i i'm a big um i really like to you know engage you know, it's, it's really, it's really cool to like engage in huge social movements, you know, marches with thousands of people like that's awesome. But when it comes down to it, the work is individual people. And so with COVID, you know, looking for ways to help people individually, running to the grocery store for elderly or immunocompromised neighbors, like, that is a huge thing. I've had to do that before. And, you know, like my, my neighbor's you know, they're, they're scared to go to the store. They, they can't go to the store because if they catch COVID, they'll die. Like, like these are like life and death, death issues for them. So, you know, just doing small things like that is, man, I, I just, I cannot stress that enough that, you know, it's, it's the small steps. And I appreciate that perspective, Audra, because I think that when we're faced with what seems to be an overwhelming load, like, you know, emotional load of injustice and inequity in the world, it seems like our attempts at making a difference can be frivolous. And that's, it, it's not true. I mean, when you just demonstrated, just having a conversation with somebody, um, you know, maybe understanding the standpoint from which they're coming is one that lacks information and trying to discuss, you know, on their terms to an extent, but also being firm, like you said, um, a different perspective is really important and helping someone in need, even if it's just a neighbor. Uh, 
that's not just a neighbor, that's, that's someone you care about, that's someone who matters to the community. And these, what we may perceive as smaller, um, smaller things that we do affect a larger change. And I mean, it sounds cliche to say so, but it's really true. I mean, that's how you start building a movement. That's how you start making a difference is in our own communities and in our own neighborhood. And when we're able to make those connections between the work that we're doing kind of, you know, head down, moving forward with how it affects our perception of national, international, even regional issues, it really does make a difference. Um, an example that in my world literature class is not a um, service learning class, but this is where civic engagement, the concept of asking each other to continually engage with um, current issues and the, you know, the civic life of our communities can really make a difference. We've been looking, we've been reading in my world literature class documents to do with evolutionary movements, not just in the United States, but in other countries as well. And I kind of, and we're looking at mostly stuff from the 19th century um, and the late 18th century. And I just threw in there, you know, an article about the recent surge in Black Lives Matter protests in response to um, the death of George Floyd, uh, you know, certainly during the summer, but other things that have come up since then. And I asked students to reflect upon that. And many students, you know, were grateful to make those connections. And so again, it's connecting those things that we do in our everyday lives to those wider issues and how we can make a difference, how we can think differently about it. It's something that I think is really powerful and something that all of us can engage in, whether we're out there in the streets or just having a conversation with someone. So I appreciate that, thank you. Um, Lindsay, may I turn to you and I'll put the question back up. Eventually, there we go. I mean, I would, I'd like to start by saying I really liked what Audra said about even small acts in your community, like doing this, doing grocery shopping for your neighbor. I mean, it may be something small to you, but it's, it's made their whole week better. And that, just like the idea of how like that effect can ripple out. I, I mean, I think that's an important thing. Um, how can we connect efforts? Uh, one thing that I think is interesting about St. Louis and Missouri in general is that sometimes we are deemed a Midwestern state and sometimes we're seen as, we're called something called like the heartland. Sometimes we're seen as a Southern state. And the thing that I think is the worst thing about Missouri, but also the best thing is like, we have everything here. Like the opioid crisis is here racist systems are very apparent that they're working here. I, mean, I had a list. We have nuclear waste that's been dumped in various locations. Um, and, and gentrification is happening in St. Louis City. There's, there's, there's all the things. And I think dealing with these locally, I mean, if, you fix, if you're working to fix Missouri, it's also fixing the country because Missouri kind of is the microcosm of the United States. I, I'm just just throwing that out there, but I I do really believe in. Um, I think I think both of you might have touched on it, but when you see these problems that are happening, like at the national level, you are overwhelmed and like, what can I even begin to do to change this? Like, I cannot get the Clean Air Act through. Or I cannot I cannot get rid of Citizens United, but you know, if you start working at, maybe you don't even want to start at the state level, maybe you want to start at the local level by emailing your council person and asking them about this ordinance that would really help kids in your district. Like it could be a very small thing. And I think that it, it does have a ripple effect and it does help change locally. So then maybe next, next change is on the state level. Thank you, Lindsay. Grace? So I don't, I don't want to take too long because I think I um, talked about how a lot of my assignments address this issue, but I think it's very important that we, if you believe in social justice and if you um, want to be, I, I, I guess I could just say in history, it's always been ordinary people who have brought about the greatest change. Like we look at the civil rights movement and we look at Martin Luther King Jr. And yes, he was very charismatic and he did like serve as sort of like a spokesperson for that movement, but it's the thousands of African-American and white civilians who got into the streets and marched and made those things all possible. It wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for all those people. 
So I think um, it's just really important to focus on like, instead of getting like overwhelmed with the entirety of it all, um, to focus on like, just <laughs> looking at the past in history and what has been, what has been accomplished. It might look too hard. Um, it might look impossible, but just to get started and to do a little thing, like to make a little change, um, to connect to your larger community. Um, I remember several years ago when I was doing one of the presentations on Ferguson, somebody asked me, what can I as a white person do? Like, this is just too overwhelming. What can I do? And I said, the next time your family says something racist, call them out on it. Speak up. That is activism. That is being an anti-racist. Um, like, I love the idea of establishing a neighborhood compost, like just a small step like that can still bring about like waves of change. And most of the time, we're not going to even be aware of the difference that we make. And isn't it worth it if it helps just one person? Like, to me, that's amazing to even think that you can make an impact even just for one individual. And we may not see the, the changes that happen immediately. We might not ever see it in our lifetime. We might not, nobody might, somebody might not ever come up to you and say, hey, you did this back in 2020 and it made a difference in my life. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like if it's something that needs to be changed, if you can help, if you can help make things better for one person, to me, that's worth it. And I agree with that, Grace. And I remember when, um, the four of us got together last week to kind of discuss what we were planning to do with this panel, what we wanted to talk about. Um, we talked about the idea of teaching in a lot of respects as a form of activism, whether you teach history, whether you teach literature, or even if you teach in um, allied health or in mathematics or in science or in any discipline, there is an opportunity to affect change in some way, shape, or form. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the context of a service learning class. Um, you know, that's one way to really make a focus. But it's also about the conversations that we have with our students. It's about the conversations that we have during class, outside of class, and the way that we structure our material. There are so many different ways to be civically engaged in the work that we do on campus and as students. Um, that can still make a difference either on a you know a micro level or a more macro pedagogical level that involves community work so um, certainly things to think about uh, and so i am going to i know we could talk about all of these questions for a very very long time but i am going to move on to question four here uh, which is this thing would like to go how can we best take the learning with us once we leave the classroom and or complete a particular project, even if it's something that you do that's not necessarily related to a class that you take or a class that you teach? And um, Grace, would I be able to start with you on this question? Um, I, will, I will try to answer that question. Um, I think I, I just don't, I think it's just going to happen naturally. Like if you devote your time and energy towards doing a project, it's going to stick with you and it's going to be in your mind and you're going to be thinking about it. And so like, I don't know if it's necessarily that, I mean, like the purpose of service learning is to, it's another level of education to incorporate what you're learning and, and make it like it's an application instead of just memorizing facts or, or principles or data, it's actually teaching you to apply what you're learning to the world around you. And I just, I don't know how you couldn't take it with you when you were done. Like, I just think that's gonna become a part of you and you're gonna have that experience and it's gonna change everything that you do from there on out. I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but I, I just don't know how you could do something like this and not be invested in it and have it remain. Yeah, and I think that you're you're certainly onto something with that there. I mean, we can look at how we take our learning with us both in just in terms of how our mindsets change or with respect to the work that we continue to do after completing a particular project. So I think that that's absolutely a viable way of looking at it. I mean, I know for myself, um, when I was an undergraduate at UMSL, I was really active in the gender studies program. I did a um, an undergraduate certificate and continued to pursue that in my graduate work, but undergrad, which for a lot of us is where these issues really start to hit and you start to make a realization about 
the world around us and the, the injustice and inequities that we face. And there are still moments coming out of various classes that still resonate with me today, you know, half a lifetime later. And so I think that you're absolutely right. It's, it's, we take it with us, whether we realize it or not. So that, that's really powerful. Um, Lindsay, can I move to you? Yeah, sure. I think that one thing that I've been thinking about as Grace has been talking is like, for example, if you are a white person who has never thought about racism at all and thought it was solved during the civil rights movement, I think that the act of educating yourself is an act of service. Like, like if, if being in Grace's African-American history class starts to open your eyes to this whole lived experience that you were blind to, you could continue that education and keep reading. And there's, there's a whole lot of resources online. You can continue your education. I think, um, I think one of the things that the service, the college's mission, I, I wrote it down, it's lifelong learning in a global society. I think that's what classes do. They, you, you get a taste of something and you can continue that on your own. Grace is going to give you the resources to keep going. And I think, um, on a different note, uh, something that you can do after the classroom, just thinking about like the, the skills you get in an English 101 class. One of the, the course objectives they have to do with research, they have to do with writing and communicating. And those are, those are um, skills that can help you as like, you know, whether you are an aunt or an uncle or a parent, or if there's just a child that's in, uh, you know, in your life that you are responsible for, you might, you will be attending meetings at their school. You will be advocating for them. You will undoubtedly start to live in a community and be like, this noise ordinance is wrong and you will need to do some research on it. And you will need to go to the, the city board meeting and you will need to explain why the, the, board, the noise ordinance, what the problem is. So I, I think that these skills are transferable and you'll be using them after the class ends. Can I, can I say one other thing piggybacking off of what Lindsay said? I think that is so powerful. So many of us like hear about something and they think we can't, what can we do? We can't do anything about it. Service learning actually gives you the tools to be a civically engaged person, to be engaged in your community and teaches you how to do that. So it, it, it's an empowering experience, I think. Thank you for that. Audra? I think, Lindsay basically said what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but, you know, kind of going off that a little bit, students, let's let's not forget what we learn. You know, what we, these classes, we have to take these classes for a reason. And it's not just for the credits. It's easy to focus on the credits. Oh man, I, you know, I need to get my history credits. So I'm just gonna like do the class and like get it over with. But that's not the purpose of learning. The purpose of learning is to become better humans. And we need to take what we learn in our history class, our sociology classes, anthropology, English, science. We, we need to take these and we need to apply them to our daily lives. And we need to never stop being curious because the second we stop being curious is the second we begin to stagnate. And when we begin to stagnate, we're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to help anyone. We're just going to go through the motions and that that's no way to live. So students just, I know there's a lot of information in the classes and sometimes it can be very overwhelming, but keep the notes, keep the resources if possible. Just don't forget. <laughs> I cannot stress this enough. Don't forget. I appreciate that so much, Audra. And I know that all of us as instructors and lifelong learners, you know, appreciate that and also you know feel what you're saying as well and, and those of us who are invested in education you know in terms of it being our profession you know continue to uh, well hopefully learn new information challenge ourselves stimulate ourselves and it's, it's vital that we look at education not just as getting through a class obtaining a credit getting a degree even though on some level those things are important obviously to obtain to you know obtain a certain kind of career path we have to obtain a degree in the qualifications to get us there but it's also about what's in the class 
that matters, as you're saying. And I, and I think you just put it so well in ways that I'm not even going to bother trying to resummarize everything you said because I've just I, I'm floored by you know your your clarity and precision with that. Uh, and I am going to take an opportunity to make a plug for Audra's own work. Uh, one way that you can make that argument, uh, if I may, Audra, uh, ask you to talk a little bit about it. Uh, Audra is an author, and I think that this is a wonderful way that her activism extends outside of the classroom and um, truly shows um, how these things can still resonate with us and affect others even after we learn learn after we leave the classroom is this showing on here your website yes okay Thank you. perfect if you wouldn't mind uh, i'd love for you to give a plug for your book awesome yeah i wrote this book um i wrote it because i have two children they're they're very young and when i began protesting they became very curious about what they were going to do um what i where i was going the, the signs that I would make, they made their own signs. They couldn't really spell. So it was just random letters scattered over a piece of cardboard. It was adorable. So I wrote this book because I wanted to teach children that you don't have to be a grown up in order to make a difference in your community. In this book, Ellie has a little friend and her friend is bullied at school. And Ellie learns how to stand up to a bully. And then later on in the book, she learns how to make a protest sign and how to go to a protest safely with the grown-ups in her life. And I don't know, the, the illustrations are really cute too. I didn't do them, but <laughs> I'm not an artist. They're really cute. Yeah, thank you. It's a beautiful book and it's so well done. And it really does speak to a lot of what we're talking about here. Again, that idea that what we teach our children, how we interact with our communities, how children and others see us interact with our communities and respond to these issues is so important. So thank you for that. All right, last question, and then we'll see, hopefully if the audience has some questions, we can spend a little bit of time on that, though I know we're getting toward the end. Um, last question here, question five, what advice, encouragement, et cetera, whatever it is you want to say, uh, do you have for students and faculty interested in undertaking service learning and civic engagement in their classes, but are unsure of how to approach it in this class? However you define the climate, COVID-19, other things that are happening, um, current issues, et cetera. Um, oh, I need to call on someone. May I start with you, Lindsay? You may start with me. I think that advice, so I'm going to do a slightly different thing. And oh. that's just, I'm going to be super pragmatic. Like, why would you want to take a service learning class? I, we've 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 offered lots of ways you can make it work remotely. I so I don't want to get into that anymore. Why would you want to take a service learning class? That that's where I'm I'm going to kind of go with this. Uh, so I have a, actually I have a bachelor's degree in education, and so to get a bachelor's degree in education, you have to do student teaching. And so prior to student teaching, you do lots of um, classes where they teach you about education and teaching, and then you go into a classroom and do it. And I know that's not, it wasn't technically a service learning class, but I can't describe the, um, the transition from reading about teaching in a book and then actually standing in front of 25 students and doing it. And that teaches, that really reinforces what you're learning. So I think a service learning class where you get to take the concept from class and put it into action will reinforce whatever it is you're trying to learn. So there's that. One other pragmatic thing is, hey, there are scholarships that you have to write down that you've done significant like service or community service. And this like will give you a chance to do that community service that you need to put on applications to get scholarships, but you're using class time to do it. So there's that, that's very pragmatic. And then I think my final one is, um, there's also the idea of internships and internships are, generally not paid and generally p students that participate them are affluent and then they have a, a like a leg up when they're applying for jobs because they've done this unpaid internship that they could afford to do because of their financial situation so i also propose doing service learning you're getting some time off from traditional things in the class you can do the service and get 
like work with an agency and you can do some service in an area, it's not an internship, but it does give you like that real life experience that you can put on your resume. So that's me being very pragmatic. I appreciate that, Lindsay. Thank you. Audra? I want to encourage people not to give up. It's discouraging sometimes. Um, burnout is real, but it's okay to take time for self-care. I've had to do that before, um, but don't give up. It's, it's important work. We have our whole lives to do it. It's not, unfortunately, the work's never going to go away. If we get one issue resolved, there's going to be another issue. And you know, that's just, that's just human nature. It's just, just, just the way it is. Um, focus your energy on something. Um, I heard a quote a long time ago. I don't know, it's not really a quote, but I heard someone say a long time ago that instead of devoting our energy to many causes and many issues and many things, if we find something to focus on, we can devote all our energy to that. We can be like a laser beam. You know, a light bulb lights up a whole room, but it can't perform surgery. It can't cut metal. If we can pretend that we're like laser beams and really focus our energy on the one thing, we can make a difference in that one area. I think that is thoughtful and very um, pointed advice because it's easy to feel overwhelmed when we look at the state of things and we realize how much work has to be done. But that's where we, you know, pull up our sleeves and dig into what we're able to do. And again, you know, we may find that our activism and our pursuit of equity takes different forms and that's okay. Some people may go out in the streets and participate in a protest for a cause they care about. Um, some may write children's books hoping to educate young kids about uh, diversity and equity. Uh, some of us may teach. Some of us may write our Congress people participate in a political campaign. All of these things are valid and just and do the work. So I think I, I really thank you for putting it that way. And then last but not least, Grace. Hey, I just wanted to um, share with, uh, I think everybody has talked about students. I wanted to address faculty that are considering undertaking a service learning course. I hesitated doing it for a very long time because I thought it had to be the perfect assignment and I just couldn't think of how I could do it. But expand your definition of service learning. It's more than just community service. It's more than just um, going out and specifically working for a history project or math or science or any of those things. So, uh, civic engagement is so much more than that. And there's so many applications that you could, could come up with. So just be creative. And it doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect. It, if you just try, if you're open to including this uh, in your curriculum, it's gonna make a difference, whether it's in your students' lives or, I mean, think about the opportunity that you have as somebody who is in math or science or any of the STEM fields, an opportunity to, to show your students that you can still be civically conscious and engaged in working towards making your environment better. I mean, there are so many applications to this. And we as a community college have a responsibility to serve the community. And so showing students how they can do that with a biology background or with um, an accounting background, like there's so many different things that could still happen if you expand it beyond just what we traditionally think of as community service. Um, and what a, what a learning experience, what an amazing thing. And um, it's really funny. I was actually just um, on my computer because I just bought Audra's book because I forgot to do that. <laughs> just bought it for my student, my kids. But um, a Nelson Mandela quote came up and I was like, oh, how perfect. And it said, um, what is it? Let me see. Uh, it always seems impossible until it is done. And so we are tackling things that seem impossible. But like with history, we can see impossible things have been surmounted at other times in history. So we just got to keep plugging away and doing it and make a difference in a small way within our own environment. But faculty, if you're listening, please just look at that civic engagement wheel 
get inspired and think about ways that you can engage your students this semester or in coming semesters, just give it a shot. I mean, there are so many different options that can help them engage their community in your subject. That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And I echo everything you said. And you know who to talk to if you want to uh, work toward making class the service learning class faculty and certainly talk with your colleagues as well. I know that we have hit the 1245 um, minute. So uh, I don't know if there are any questions. I'm more than happy to stay on for a few minutes if appropriate. And I'm putting all of our contact info up here um, in case you'd like to speak with any of us and certainly uh, consider purchasing Audra's book, audranotgrass.com. Uh, but so I'll leave this up here for a second. But in the meantime, Michael, are there any questions from anybody? Anything anyone wants to add? No, I've been uh, monitoring the chat box and there was a question very early about what are some of the different ways to engage and, and work towards social justice. And you guys have, have addressed that beautifully. This session hits the beating heart of what this forum is all about with Democracy Days. It was wonderful. And it reminds me a little bit of the expression that sometimes people use in, in the organization I'm involved in, Potbangers. You know, we get a new volunteer and what do they do? Well, we just say, you know, jump in where you fit in. If you can cook, you know, you can help out that way. If you're not great at cooking, uh, how about this? You know, just so many different ways. And that's just with one organization. What you guys just did was come up with so many ideas and anybody at any level can plug in somewhere. And what you did was just offer a profusion of ideas. Thank you. We are happy to do it. Thank you for having us. And thank you to all of you who tuned in or who will tune in later, watch this. Thank you to the panelists. I know that, you know, with this being an interesting semester and an interesting year, it's uh, it's been a challenge getting everything up and running. So I really appreciate everyone's efforts, including the rest of the service learning faculty and students who are doing the work, putting the time in. Thank you so much. And anyone who might be interested in pursuing this for the spring, hopefully this gives you a wealth of ideas where we can start. Uh, and so email us, contact us. Thank you, Audra, Grace, Lindsay, and Michael, and all of you. Thanks, Brianny. Thanks, Michael. Thank Take care. Thank Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you.